Pop quiz. Which of the following is the old one out? Annoyingly superior cartoon hound Snoopy, Elizabethan explorer and totally uncontroversial English swashbuckler Sir Francis Drake, a Russian T-14 Armata tank, or 1984's franchise-topping Bill Murray Fest Ghostbusters? The answer, the tank. Snoopy's, Drake's and Ghostbusters are all names for US military teams successfully combating drones whereas the T-14 Armata tank is apparently so vulnerable to airborne attack the Kremlin won't let it do anything more risky than trundle up and down Red Square, making it the most expensive parade float the world has ever known. I wonder why. Look at Ukraine right now and Kyiv's forces appear to be on the back foot. They haven't yet completed in-depth defensive fortifications on anything like the scale of Moscow's Surovikin line that proved so effective at blunting Ukraine's counter-offensive. Russia's troops are advancing across the front, albeit in salami slices, often literally. And despite Kyiv's cross-border raids and oil refinery strikes, Putin generally has momentum. So why isn't he capitalizing on this by sending the Armata into action? I'll come to the answer shortly, but first, a brief segue into what a tank is. At its most basic, a tank is still the optimum blend of firepower, mobility and protection on the battlefield. Prioritise just two of those three and you'll come a cropper. Sure, you can have a massive gun and cover the vehicle in so much armour it's as well protected as Francis Durnley's wallet on a night out. But the thing won't move an inch, like Francis Durnley's wallet on a night out. Or you could go for a battlefield racing car with a bit of decent firepower, but you'll have to surrender most of the armour to buy that zip. Finally, you could build something that's heavily armoured and still able to move around over smashed terrain, but that's called an armoured personnel carrier, known by troops as a battle taxi, just there to deliver you safely into the fight. There won't be any room or power in the engine for a big gun on top as well. So in a proper punch-up, a tank is still the best combination of what the Royal Armoured Corps calls the Holy Trinity. Tanks are heavy beasts though. So heavy in fact that the majority of the armour is located on the front of the hull and the turret, the bits that on battlefields gone by are the only parts likely to face the enemy. The war in Ukraine, however, has consigned notions of the traditional battlefield to history. These days drones, especially so-called first-person view drones that are flown directly to a target by soldiers wearing remote headsets, can pick out which part of a tank to attack. Why go for the heavily armoured front of the turret when you can just as easily scoot round the back to hit the thin metal at the rear? Or blast the tracks? If it can't go anywhere, it's easy prey. Or why not fly or drop a grenade right through an open hatch, causing all the ammunition to explode and watch a new entry in the Russian tank turret tossing competition? So tanks, other armoured vehicles and pretty much every military platform, including individual soldiers, now need some form of defence against drones. And that's why the US has developed clunkily titled electronic warfare systems such as the drone restricted access using no DW, the Drake system, and when at sea, have teams of sailors looking out for surface and air contacts heading towards them, delightfully if cringingly named ship, nautical or otherwise photographic interpretation and exploitation teams, or Snoopies. Teams using the Drake system and other short range electronic warfare kits often carry the techno gear in a backpack, so they've become known as Ghostbusters after the hit 1980s movie, which is the best in the franchise, don't even bother emailing. So Snoopy, Drake and Ghostbusters. Don't blame me, I didn't make them up. Russia has also been rapidly developing electronic warfare kit to counter drones. One system, known as Volnares, which means breakwater, was first seen last year fitted to a T-80 tank at a Russian arms exhibition. The majority of drones in Ukraine are cheap, and barely more sophisticated than those you'd find being used by civilian hobbyists. They can be countered with various techniques and technologies, from physical nets, 
into electronic warfare jammers. These work by cutting the radio signal, which has to be over an uninterrupted line of sight from the controller to the drone. We've all seen the footage. When a drone approaches a tank and is either jammed or loses the signal as the aircraft dips behind trees or buildings, the screen goes all fuzzy. That's the signal being lost. The controller hopes the drone will hit the target and not veer off at the last second. Snap that radio link far enough away and the drone will either hover until the battery runs out, return to base or head off to a predetermined point well away from your own location. That last is the most likely outcome as the last thing a controller wants is for their own drone to head merrily back like an excited Labrador with his tongue hanging out, leading a swarm of enemy drones, artillery or other heavy metal right to their location. So in an area where there's jamming or a lot of ground clutter, the controller has to just hope that sheer inertia carries the drone onto the target if the signal's lost, right? Well, perhaps not for much longer. Advances in artificial intelligence and the inevitable miniaturization of technology means we're on the cusp of having automatic target recognition capability on the smallest drones operating today. This capability isn't that new. Infrared sensors on Tomahawk cruise missiles have been staring at the ground and matching what it sees to a pre-programmed library of images for years, so it navigates to the right place. The thing is though, Tomahawks are big, lots of room on board for the computing technology. Tactical drones, not so much. But as the space needed for all that clever technology keeps reducing, just as the capability of machine learning AI systems keeps increasing, there will soon be a tipping point when tactical drones can pick their own targets. Lose the signal back to the controller? No problem, says the drone. I know the difference between a tank and an artillery piece, or a transit van, or a building. I even know where best to hit the tank. I'll take it from here. It raises the prospect of soldiers launching drones into pre-designated kill boxes, where they hunt for their own targets. Tanks, armored personnel carriers, humans. This evolution of warfare is surrounded by ethical considerations which, perhaps most alarmingly, are some way behind the technology. All of which means we're not going to be seeing any T-14 Armatas in Ukraine anytime soon. They're prestigious bits of kit. Moscow doesn't want to put them in harm's way and risk images of smoking T-14 hulls doing the rounds on social media. That wouldn't be good for Putin's fragile ego, or for that matter, the retirement prospects of the local commander. Sure, the Armata's fully automated turret is a clever idea, keeping the three-man crew in the better protected hull, but it's thought to be a bit temperamental. Plus, the engine is a bit dodgy and prone to sudden hissy fits, followed by a truculent refusal to produce enough power for the tank to move anywhere exactly not what's required when there are drones hunting for you, with or without the Volnerys gear. Even so, Russia currently has the initiative in the tactical land battle in Ukraine. Kyiv has been criticised for not building a Zeluzhny or Zelensky line or whatever you want to call a defensive undertaking on the same scale as Russia's Surovikin line. Of course, investment in a multi-layered defensive line takes time, manpower, probably civilian as well as military, and money, which could otherwise be spent elsewhere. So can we blame them? Yes, is my answer. After two years of fighting, the defense lines that some Ukrainians claim to be good and started a long time ago simply do not exist in any militarily meaningful form. Most of what has been constructed are bog-standard ditches with a few concrete features. History has proven these to be ineffective. Dragon's teeth, for example, can be forced into soft ground or have earth pushed onto them to create a bridge. Many defensive trench positions are little more than muddy ditches. Properly constructed fighting positions with strength and walls and appropriate overhead protection are extremely rare. The troops in frontline units are simply too tired, poorly trained or ill-equipped to create what is needed. There's one more impediment to the construction of a good defensive line, one that is proving stubborn for senior Ukrainian commanders to shake. The old Soviet mindset that sees defensive investment as the admission of defeat, a tacit belief that one is only going backwards from now on. 
Western armies see it very differently. They see a properly constructed defensive line as the springboard from which to deliver extreme violence upon the enemy. It is not a passive act. A well-designed defensive line can be the base of an incredibly aggressive and effective strategy, provided it has mutually supporting positions, reserves ready to tackle the unexpected, a deception plan that is more than just camouflage, and defence in depth, so, if necessary, you can fall back in good order to strike again, rather than collapse in the face of the enemy. Our podcast team visited Ukraine in February. Some senior military and policy officials there were reluctant to accept there were shortfalls in Ukraine's defensive line. However, former Special Forces Commander Colonel Roman Koshtenko, now an MP, albeit back in uniform since the start of the full-scale invasion, said he believed it was Ukraine's fault there was no line. He wished they had started earlier. Russia's approach towards this is better, he told me. Ukrainian forces counted on more manoeuvred actions and the defence was just underestimated, he said. You can catch up on all our interviews from Ukraine by searching recent podcast episodes. Colonel Kostenko knows what he's talking about and his level of honesty and reflection is needed now across the whole of Ukraine's armed forces. Drones and a Herculean fighting spirit in the men and women on the zero line, the line of contact, is for now holding back the Russian army. The armatas aren't coming, a bit like the money and ammunition pledged by those in the West who promised to stand by Ukraine, whatever it takes. But what's left of the rest of the Russian tank force could be on the way soon. And with a constipated supply line from Western supporters, Ukraine is in a jam. It's time to get underground. Defence in Depth is a regular video output by The Telegraph of the big defence stories. If you'd like a daily fix of content about the war in Ukraine, I'd suggest Ukraine the Latest, The Telegraph's podcast. For more defence stories, we've left links in the description below. And if you have a topic you'd like us to cover, let us know in the comments. Please do visit our website for the latest updates, news and analysis. Or failing that, you could buy the paper.